But if we don't do something about how we manage our agricultural soils, they could be gone within 60 or 70 years. And of course, that would threaten the food security of billions of people, even before sea level rise took hold and uh, threatened low-lying coastal areas. I want to thank you all for coming and joining us for another Scientist's Warning program. I'm Stuart Scott, my co-host Victoria Hirth, and we're coming to you live from COP24, the Conference of Parties in Katowice, Poland. I'll show the contact address again at the end. Victoria is an Associate Professor of Sustainable Business with the University of Plymouth. I'm the Executive Director of scientistswarning.org and I'm on the staff of the University of Reality. Today's guest with us, Dr. David Beerling, who's the director of the Leverhulme Center for Climate Change Mitigation of the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. And today's program, Saving Ourselves with Rocks, Crops, and Soil. Now, I'd like to show you a, a little bit from the BBC News, which covers uh, David's work, and it'll set the stage for what we're going, he's going to speak about today. Scientists looking at climate change say that 20 of the warmest years on record have come in the last 22 years. And the research by, by the World Meteorological Organization says that four of the hottest years have been in the past four years alone. It comes as experts calculate that reducing our emissions of greenhouse gases won't be enough. We've got to work out how to remove them as well. Our science editor David Shookman investigates. In an underground laboratory, Plants are grown in carefully monitored conditions. Instruments keep track of every detail. And mixed into the soil is a powder. It's rock that's been ground up. This is a major project to see if agriculture can help tackle climate change. These plants look normal enough, but they're part of a highly unusual experiment that could prove incredibly useful. That's because the scientists here have worked out that adding powdered volcanic rock to the soil massively increases the amount of carbon dioxide that's drawn out of the air. And because that's the gas that's driving the rise in temperatures, anything to help get rid of it could make a difference. On an experimental farm in the American Midwest, the powdered rock is being tested on the fields. Already the scientists have seen that it acts as a fertiliser, they don't yet know whether at this massive scale the process also traps carbon dioxide. But they're convinced that it's worth trying. The world needs to wake up to the fact that we need to reduce our emissions and combine it with technologies for removing CO2. And at the moment we have no idea how to remove billions of tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere. Maybe the answer will lie with the plants and the powdered rock. Or the minerals in a slag heap will prove to be useful. In any event, there's now a frantic effort to find out. And all the time, the more carbon dioxide builds up in the air, the more urgent it becomes to somehow get it out. David Shuckman, BBC News. Before I give the mic over to David, I want to note one thing he said in that video. We have no idea how to get it out. I frequently make accusations of the COP process because they perennially work to make people feel they've got it under control when in fact they are clueless. Knowingly, they are heading towards greater and greater emissions, hoping that someday the fix will come and we will be able to get that carbon dioxide out. And yet they're not researching, they're not funding properly what needs to be done to get that carbon dioxide out. And I'm very proud and, and honored to have David here to present something that is one of those win-win-win situations. So David, would you take it away? Thank you, Stuart. I just want to start by highlighting why we need to have large-scale strategies for taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And basically, people outside the, the public, outside the COP24 bubble, tend to assume that we've fixed climate post the Paris Agreement. And the fallacy of that logic is um, exposed by something called the CO2 emissions gap, which is illustrated in this chart here. So along the bottom axis there is time, and then on the right-hand axis 
is the billions of tons of carbon dioxide that we've emitted. So the black line is what we've emitted, and then the colored lines indicate different trajectories. And you can see that as the uh, business as usual, we follow business as usual, our emissions of carbon dioxide are likely to increase from around 47, 45 billion tons of CO2 a year up to 60. If we factor in the Paris Agreement pledges, then they come down to where that pink line is. But where they really need to be if we want to keep the planet from warming uh, two degrees is down here. If we want to keep the planet from warming one and a half degrees, they need to be even lower. And so the discrepancy between where our emissions are heading and where our emissions need to be is something that's called the emissions gap. And you can see that it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we go forward in time. Just to summarize this then, after at 2030, the emissions gap is somewhere between 17 and 21 billion tons of CO2 a year. It's not nearly enough to uh, limit warming to two degrees. If you want to limit warming to one and a half degrees, the emission gap's even bigger and is around 23 to 27 billion tons of CO2 a year. And this emissions gap problem is why the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change assumes that we can extract CO2 out of the atmosphere post-2050. And if you look in the report, buried in that report is the assumption that we can extract 12 billion tons a year somehow of carbon dioxide. And we really don't have a clue how to do this in a way that's scalable, that's cheap, and that has feasibility with limited environmental consequences. And so as a consequence of this, uh, a number of scientific academies of nations around the world have got together to review the evidence for how this might be done. This is at the cover of the European Academy's Scientific Advisory Council report. But all of the reports review the same evidence, and they all come to the same conclusion, that it's too early to pick winners and losers in this process, and that we need more research, R&D, to understand how these technologies might work. In terms of the winners and losers, apparently the fossil fuel industry thinks that they are losers and they are doing their best to hold up any progress the negotiations might make. Okay, so, so the work that we're doing at the Levy Hume Center for Climate Change Mitigation focuses on a carbon capture technology called enhanced weathering. And the basic idea is that you apply crushed silicate rocks or volcanic rocks to the land surface, possibly of a crop land, and then that rock interacts with the soil, pulls CO2 into the soil, changes the chemistry of the soil water, and eventually draws CO2 into the surface ocean. So it's using soils and the surface ocean as a storage depot for CO2. And once it gets in there, it has a lifetime of in excess of 100,000 years. So it it fertilizes the land and then it, it sequesters carbon on the bottom of the ocean. It's a win-win situation. Okay. Yeah. And, and it, uh, from what I understand, therefore, it's much more stable in terms of uh, an extraction technology because it's not likely to escape. <laughs> it's using soils and the ocean as a natural storage depot. Yeah. Whereas if you're going to do something like bioenergy with carbon capture mm -hmm. and storage, then you need to capture the CO2 pressurize it, and then inject it underground, under the ocean most usually, and hope that it stays there. So there are a number of risks, obviously, and what we're saying is that for this particular technology, that particular risk is something we don't need to concern ourselves with. So just to show you so three sort of uh, key features of this approach. The first is the application of silicate rocks to croplands harnesses natural reactions that we think have been regulating CO2 and climate for millions of years. The second is we're already applying crushed rocks to the land surface, okay? So we're already applying crushed lime or limestone to the land surface to reverse soil acidification as a consequence of agriculture. So the infrastructure and the machinery is already there to switch from lime to a silicate rock. And that means that it's scalable relatively easily if it works. But it's also an approach that's compatible with other carbon capture strategies or greenhouse gas removal strategies. So if you are going to grow large amounts of bioenergy crop as part of a bioenergy carbon capture and storage program, you could, grow, you could grow those crops in combination with crushed rock and double down on your carbon capture. Similarly, if you were going to go down with the biochar route to capture carbon, you could grow those crops with uh, crushed rocks and capture carbon before you made your biochar. 
One question before you go on. <clears throat> Next to CO2 in the cloud, there's the abbreviation AQ. What is that? Okay, so that's aqueous. So CO2 in the atmosphere dissolves in rainwater to form a very weak acid, which then falls. Rainfall is essentially a very weak acidic solution. So you're, you're using rain to cleanse the CO2 out of the air? Rain and also the activities of the roots of the crops and yeah. the associated root microbes. Yeah. So some of the benefits that we think might accrue from applying crushed volcanic rocks to the land surface are illustrated in this slide. So we know from prior experiments that if you bury crushed rocks, it stimulates the symbiotic fungi that are associated with the roots of these crops so they can take up nutrients more easily. We know that as these crops weather, they produce a form of silica that the plants can take up. And this makes the, the stems and the cells much tougher and more resistant to attack by pathogens and herbivorous insects. It also generates alkalinity in the soil, so it reverses this problem of soil acidification. And many soils in Europe and North America are depleted in micronutrients because of intensive cropping. And so if you apply basalt, then this provides a source of micronutrients that replenishes those depleted reservoirs. The fifth benefit is that by harvesting, most of our food crops are silica accumulating. So they're grasses that accumulate silica in phytoliths. And as we repeatedly harvest these crops, we're essentially silica stripping our soils. In the US, we're silica stripping to the tune of 21 million tons of silica a year. And so if you apply silica back to these soils, then you're basically restoring this depleted reservoir. So silica is not one of the things that you normally hear about in agriculture uh, as an amendment. No, that's right. But the, in the soil science community, there, it's well established that silica is one of those non-essential elements that has a number of positive effects on plant growth and yield. Non-essential, but essential. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And then ultimately this basalt breaks down into a number of other different products that can also help soil health. It can improve, for example, the soil carbon concentration around these basalt grains. And ultimately the basalt grains decay into clays so they can increase the nutrient holding capacity of these soils. So basically this works well for sandy acidic soils of which a number of crops that are grown at scale are grown in those kinds of lands. So it's very useful in that capacity. However, presumably then limitations where you have more alkaline and clay soils that you wouldn't want to increase those aspects. Large amounts of biofuel like sugarcane are grown in Brazil and also in uh, northern Australia on very acidic sandy soils that require a lot of lime and a lot of fertilizers. So it could be some big wins there. Nobody's ever tried doing it with uh, clay, more loamy soils, like in the Corn Belt of the US or in, or in Europe. And so I think there's an open question as to how, how this type of uh, adaptate or this type of soil amendment mm. would affect um, crop production. And that's one of the core objectives of our center. Because presumably, if this is something that's going to be layered on year after year after year, um, at some point, those balances and that those positive aspects could change or perhaps there are other things that can be done to to bring that round so presumably that's what you're working on yeah so one of the key features of our center is that we have long-term field trials to investigate exactly those questions so if all these six benefits were happening then you could decrease the agricultural usage of fertilizers and pesticides and that would decrease the cost to farmers that were doing this so it turns out if you do model simulations, you can figure out which nations of the world might be best able to capture carbon doing this approach. And this is some new simulations that we've been doing, which basically shows that the three biggest CO2 emitters, China, India, and USA, also turn out to be the countries that are best able to capture carbon, mainly because they've got large area of croplands and also because they have a warmer climate that promotes weathering. But you can see, depending on the fractional area of croplands that you would deploy this on, any one of these nations could potentially sequester a gigaton of CO2 a year. A gigaton is a billion tons. So it's non-trivial. But of course, the other side of the coin is that we need rock to do this with. And where is all this rock going to come from? And I think this challenge is also an opportunity because we know that a legacy of the mining companies since the 
start of the industrial era is that we have huge reserves of crushed basalt lying around as a waste material. So many mining companies are looking for ores or rocks that are valuable for making batteries for smartphones or solar panels or whatever, and they're, they're mining all this rock dust, all this basalt, and getting it out of the way so they can get to the valuable stuff. And so there are stockpiles of crushed basalt all around the world, billions of tons of it, that's regarded as a waste material which could be utilized for carbon capture and soil restoration. So there's another problem that uh, doing this to soils could address. And this is a quote from a UN report a couple of years ago, which recognized that we're rapidly losing our topsoil of our agricultural land to the tune of around 30 billion tons a year. And the Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, estimate that if we don't do something about how we manage our agricultural soils, they could be gone within 60 or 70 years. And of course, that would threaten the food security of billions of people, even before sea level rise took hold and uh, threatened low-lying coastal, coastal areas. Now, mind you, there are a lot of things that will multiply that threat and bring it in. I, don't, I never like to focus on the threats that are 60 or 80 or 100 years away because they, they make us uh, think that we have a lot of time to, to wait when we don't. So there's an opportunity here for thinking about how we rebuild our topsoils by using uh, crushed silicate rocks to not only restore the um, nutrient cycle, but also capture carbon as well. We've set up a global set of field trials to understand how this might work. And so we have a number of different locations from the sandy soils that we just mentioned in, on sugarcane plantations in northern Australia, all the way through to these uh, more organic-rich loamy soils in North America. And in fact, we have a field trial site in the Corn Belt of the US with colleagues from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And I'll just show you some preliminary results from the first year's treatment. So at the energy farm in Illinois, they grow two main crops. One is corn, and the other is a biofuel. So again, this starts to ask the questions, how would enhanced weathering work, not only with a corn crop, but also interactively with a biofuel crop that might go into a BEX type scenario. One of the really nice features of the energy farm in the University of Illinois is that they have these very large plots and so we have two plots which, are, which receive basalt and two plots which don't receive basalt so that we can actually see what's the effect of that basalt treatment. And so the nice thing about this energy farm is that it's a fully working farm, it's a university farm. So it has all the facilities and the farming machinery to look at how it affects the soils and how it affects the yields of the crops. 2017, last year, was the first year of treatment. And in the US, Corn Belt, just to give you a sense of the spatial scale of what's going on here, corn agriculture covers around 235 million acres. So it's a really significant crop in that part of the world. On the right here, this is the increase in yield after one year's treatment. So this is the standard fertilizer practices, but including basalt as a treatment. And you can see that we have a 15% increase in yield. We don't know whether this will be sustainable or not, but it's quite a striking uh, first, first result. Well, it, it, whether it will be sustained or not, certainly if that's a higher yield, it helps a lot with sustainability. <laughs> sure, thank you, yeah. So if you use today's corn prices, yeah, that's, a, that's an increase in yield of about equivalent to about $14 billion. Now we're talking in terms that some of the corporations can understand. If there's more money to be won, then perhaps we'll have a situation where uh, big Archer Daniels Midland will go up against ExxonMobil, perhaps. And at the same time of seeing these increase in yields, we also saw a dramatic reduction in the emissions of nitrous oxide from the soils of around 30 or 40 percent. So nitrous oxide is a potent greenhouse gas. It's about 300 times more potent than CO2. And agriculture, putting nitrogen fertilizers on agricultural fields is the primary source of anthropogenic NO2. And so seeing a reduction of 30 or 40 percent in N2O emissions from the soils is another big win that, that could accrue from this treatment. Okay, so finally then, it's worth just sort of taking a step back and thinking about the larger scale framework for how this feeds into sustainable development. And this is uh, five of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
And you can see that it ticks the boxes for some of these. So we have zero hunger, because you improve food security. If you reduce fertilizer usage and you start to recycle uh, waste materials and you also start to rebuild soils, then that's responsible consumption and production. If you're drawing CO2 down or you're abating N2 nitrous oxide emissions from soils, then that's action on climate. If you generate alkalinity and it reaches the oceans, then you're averting ocean acidification, so that improves the fisheries. And finally, if you increase your agricultural productivity for the same footprint, then you reduce pressure on uh, deforestation. Can I ask you, how quickly do we think that this could be scaled up? You, you said that actually a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the processes are in place. Um, what's, what's your feeling? When might this be? I think you mentioned something like potentially up to 2.5 billion tonnes per year of CO2 could be taken out of the atmosphere from this. How long would it take to get to that kind of level? I think the, the first thing to do is to try and figure out you know, to, to practice responsible research and innovation. So the first thing to do is small-scale field trials over a number of years to establish the evidence base. W would it work? And uh, what are the environmental consequences? So we need to understand the system much better. We're right at the start of our research program. And ultimately, we need, we need long-term trials to understand how it would work. And then I think you move from that evidence base to thinking about, OK, what's the scalability of this? And it turns out that when you, um, our experience is that when you speak to uh, quarry owners, they're often only too pleased to get rid of this material. So in Australia, we're provided with the uh, crushed basalt for nothing because the quarry owners want to green their image. And uh, it's the same in the US, that they've stockpiled huge amounts of this basalt looking for some other rock. And they're only too pleased to get it off their hands and improve food security and capture carbon. And sell it? My God. Yeah, and, and suddenly they have a waste product that has a monetary, va monetary value. Monetarizing the front end of the supply chain, I think, is what the economists call it. Mm. So, so although it's difficult to say at this, at this stage, our, our experience so far is that there are reserves out there and people are very open to engaging in doing this. So you would imagine within a decade or two, if the evidence base was there, we could see scale up quite quickly. So how does that fit in with the 1.5 degree report then in terms of timescales? Because timescales you're talking about and the timescales we have, it's very, very close. Sure, there's, it's absolutely, we should be absolutely clear, there's no substitute for emissions reductions. You're never going to get a greenhouse gas removal technology to solve the 1.5 degree climate problem. And there will never be one greenhouse gas removal technology that does the whole thing. Okay, if you have to get 12 billion tonnes of CO2 out of the atmosphere, then we're going to need a whole suite of different greenhouse gas removal options. 12 billion per year? It's an absolutely staggering number. And, and right now, we have very limited research effort in trying to understand the different options and what contribution they might realistically make. You're talking about trials that will take up to 20 years, though. Just going back to that emissions gap report, if yours are one of the most promising and it's right at the beginning, what's your confidence in terms of how we're going to be able to solve this crisis through back-ending some uh, emissions uh, capture? There's no substitute for emissions reductions. No. It's okay. much better not to admit it. It's okay. going to be incredibly difficult to remove it. So this is just a, an additional thing to add to the situation, but we should not be relying on this as a source of solvent. Absolutely. Yeah, the way to think about it is Steve Bacala's famous wedge diagram. So we need a number of wedges to bring us back to one and a half degrees. And really what this represents is just one wedge. We need multiple wedges and emissions reductions to keep us to the one and a half degree target. Now, we have one minute for a question and then we have to evacuate the room. Heiner Banking. What do you think about Terra Preta and biochar? As I said, we need to be researching all of the different options in greenhouse gas removal. And, uh, you know, biochar has a role to play. And it may even be possible to combine biochar and enhanced weathering if we can figure out the geochemistry of how they might interact. Your hosts have been myself, Stuart Scott, and Victoria Hirth. Thank you, David Beerling, for joining us. That's the address for general comments and questions to go to. And we've been coming to you live from COP24 in Katowice, Poland. Yeah.